We previously introduced linear transformations, link in the description. We saw how it's a generalization of matrix transformations, and in this video we'll generalize two more concepts from matrices to linear transformations. In terms of matrices, these concepts we're generalizing are the null space and the column space. You should recall the null space of a matrix A is the set of all vectors x so that A times x is equal to 0. These are solutions to a homogeneous linear system. Or if we view A as a matrix transformation, the null space consists of all the vectors that multiplication by A maps into 0. So all those vectors that A transforms into 0, that's the null space. You should also recall the column space of a matrix A consists of all vectors B so that there's some vector X such that A times X is equal to B. Or again, if we view A as a matrix transformation, the column space consists of all vectors that are images of at least one vector under multiplication by A. So if there's some vector X that A transforms into B, then B is in the column space, and the column space contains all such vectors. You could also think of the column space as the space that's spanned by the columns of A. The null space and column space are important subspaces, and they have nice generalizations to linear transformations. The null space generalizes to what we call the kernel of a linear transformation, which, if you've studied abstract algebra, is a concept you may be familiar with. And the column space generalizes to what we call the range of a linear transformation, which is a term you're probably familiar with. Here are the definitions. If T is a linear transformation from a vector space V to a vector space W, then the set of vectors in that domain V that T maps into the zero vector is called the kernel of T and is denoted cur of T. So the kernel consists of all those vectors that the transformation maps into the zero vector of the codomain. Just like the null space consisted of all vectors that when multiplied by A were sent to zero. Next, the set of vectors in the codomain W, which are images of at least one vector in V under that transformation T, is called the range of T and is denoted R of T. So the images of all vectors in V under the transformation T, the collection of all those images, is the range of T. It's not necessarily all of W, but whatever it consists of, that's called the range. Here is a pictorial representation of this concept. The domain vector space V and the codomain vector space W. And you can see here is the zero vector in W. Then the kernel of the transformation T is all of these vectors that get sent to that zero vector of the codomain. Again, all of these vectors in the kernel, by definition, are mapped into that single point, the zero vector of the codomain. And this parallelogram in W represents the range of the transformation T. Together, all images of the vectors of V under the transformation T lie in what's called called the range of the transformation. Of course, it's possible that the range is actually equal to the whole codomain W, but we draw it as being smaller than W just to allow for the general possibility where it is not equal to W. Next, we'll look at some basic examples of familiar linear transformations and their kernels and ranges, and then we'll prove that the kernel and the range are both subspaces of the domain and codomain, respectively. A very simple linear transformation is the zero transformation, which just maps each vector from the domain into the zero vector of the codomain. What's the kernel, then, of the zero transformation? Hopefully, you see that the kernel is actually going to be the entire domain. The entire domain is mapped into zero by the zero transformation, so the kernel is the whole domain, V. On the other hand, the range of the transformation, the set of all vectors that are mapped into by the transformation, is just going to be the set containing zero. 
that's the only thing that this transformation outputs. So for the zero transformation, its kernel is the domain v, and its range is just the set containing the zero vector. That's the only vector that this transformation will output. Another simple example is found with projection onto the xy plane. If this is the xy plane and this is a point off the plane, putting it through the transformation maps it into its shadow or projection on the xy plane. Or in other words, it just turns the z coordinate into zero. In this case, the zero vector is this order triple, zero, 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 the origin of three-dimensional space. So hopefully you can see that the kernel is actually going to consist of all points of this form. The first component, the x-coordinate, is zero. The y-coordinate is zero, and the z-coordinate can be whatever it likes. So in fact, the kernel is all points on the z-axis. Any point on the z-axis is going to be mapped into the origin, because its z-coordinate, whatever it is, is going to be turned into zero. On the other hand, any point where x is non-zero, or y is non-zero, is not going to be mapped into the origin, because its x or y coordinates will not be changed to zero when put through this transformation. So the kernel just consists of all points on the z-axis. Hopefully you can also see that the range is the entire xy plane. Since this transformation projects onto the xy plane, certainly nothing off the xy plane can be in the range but indeed the range is the entire xy plane. Since given any point on the xy plane, it's the image of every point on the vertical line passing through it. If you take any point on this vertical line, it would be projected into that original point on the xy plane. So the range of the transformation is the entire xy plane. Rotation about the origin in the xy plane is another simple example. The kernel of this transformation is zero because any non-zero vector will be rotated into another non-zero vector. It's only the zero vector which can be rotated onto the zero vector. So the kernel just contains the zero vector. The range is the entire xy plane, r squared. That's because given any vector in the xy plane, we could take the vector that results from a rotation of negative theta away from that vector, and then putting that through the transformation will get us back to the original given vector. So again, the range of this transformation is the entire xy plane, which is the codomain in this case. As promised, we'll finish with a theorem. If t is a linear transformation from a vector space v to a vector space w, then the kernel of t is a subspace of the domain v, and the range of t is a subspace of the codomain w. To prove each of these statements, we'll need to prove that the kernel and the range are non-empty, and then we'll need to prove that they are closed with respect to scalar multiplication and vector addition. By definition, we already know that the kernel is a subset of V, and the range is a subset of W, so we don't have to prove that. Beginning with the kernel, we begin by proving the kernel is non-empty. To do this, we just note that certainly the zero vector of V is mapped in into the zero vector of w. This is because t is a linear transformation, and we've previously proven that linear transformations map zero vectors to zero vectors. So zero has to be in the kernel because it is mapped into zero. So we know the kernel's non-empty, and thus we can take two arbitrary elements, v1 and v2, from the kernel of t. We need to show that if we add these vectors together, we stay inside the kernel, so we're trying to prove closure under addition. And indeed, t of v1 plus v2, we can split up into t of v1 plus t of v2 by the additivity property of linear transformations, and each of these images, t of v1 and t of v2, we know each of those is equal to zero, because v1 and v2 were taken from the kernel, so their images under t are zero. Now zero plus zero we know is zero, and so we've shown that if v1 and v2 are from the kernel, then v1 plus v2 is transformed into zero,
and hence, by definition, v1 plus v2 is also in the kernel, and so the kernel is closed with respect to vector addition. Scalar multiplication proceeds in a similar manner. Let's consider an arbitrary scalar k times our arbitrary vector from the kernel, v1. The image of k times v1, by the homogeneity property of linear transformations, is equal to k times the image of v1. We can pull scalars out of linear transformations. We know that v1's from the kernel, so t of v1 is 0. So this is equal to k times 0, but of course that is just 0. Hence, the image of any scalar multiple of a vector from the kernel is 0. And so, k times v1 is in the kernel, and kernels are closed with respect to scalar multiplication. And that proves that the kernel of t is a subspace of the domain v. Part b for the range will proceed in a similar manner. We know that the domain v, since it's a vector space, has to contain at least the zero vector. And so the image of the zero vector, which under a linear transformation must be the zero vector, that is in the range of t. So we already know that the range must be non-empty because at the very least it contains the zero vector, which is the image of v's zero vector. Since the range is non-empty, we can take two arbitrary elements from it, say w1 and w2, and let k be an arbitrary scalar. What we need to do is find two vectors, a and b, in the domain v, so that the image of a is w1 plus w2, and the image of b is k times w1. What this is we need to show is that if we have two vectors from the range, their sum is also in the range. That is, their sum is the image of some vector in the domain. Similarly, if a vector is in the range, like w1, we need to show that any of its scalar multiples are also in the range, and hence are the image of some vector in the domain. Now, since w1 and w2 are in the range, by definition, we know there must be vectors v1 and v2 in the domain, so that the image of v1 is w1, and the image of v2 is w2. Again, that's just by definition of them being in the range. But then, we know know that t of v1 plus v2 is equal to w1 plus w2. That's because the image of a sum under a linear transformation we know is just the sum of their images. So yes, w1 plus w2 is the image of some vector in the domain. It's the image of v1 plus v2. So that suffices for our a value. We've shown that w1 plus w2 is the image of some vector in the domain. Similarly, since v1 maps into w1, it's no surprise that k times v1, which is in the domain, that's important, k times v1 is in the domain, and its image, by properties of linearity, we know is just k times w1. We can pull the scalar out of the transformation, t of v1 is w1, and so indeed k times w1 is in the range, because it is the image of some vector in the domain. It's the image of k times v1. So in this part we see if a vector w1 is the image of some other vector v1, then the kth multiple of w1 is the image of the kth multiple of v1. So we've shown that the range is non-empty and closed with respect to scalar multiplication and vector addition. So the range is a subspace of the codomain. So that's what the kernel and range of a linear transformation are. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. If you find my videos helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos and extra practice, and if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in this course. Thanks for watching. Audio.